Hello world and welcome to episode 16 of the Top Split. We're back to the original format this time as we come back from the festive season break. Before we get into it though, I just wanted to mention the giveaway I'm running on the Top Split TV Twitch channel. I'm currently running a giveaway for a full version of the game Escape from Tarkov. It's donated by a friend of all things Top Split, Mr. Hawk on Grebstad. Escape from Tarkov is a, is a first-person survival shooter that Hawken put me onto a few months ago. It's been a while since I played a first-person shooter and I wasn't in a hurry to put down my wheel and pedals and devote some time to something else, but this one actually caught my attention. I've often called it PUBG for grown-ups. It's more than that, though. It's certainly got me back periodically to grab a bit of realistic escapism from the old workaday life at least mm. i gave away a few two-week trial keys last week on stream and next saturday the 19th of january 2019 i'll be giving away a full version of the game live on the top split tv twitch channel after the latest installment of the bathurst 200 race for the friday night race club to enter you just need to join me anytime I'm streaming to earn McBeardos, which are my in-stream loyalty currency that you earn just from watching the stream. You use them to get tickets in the giveaway. Subscribers to my channel get a three times luck multiplier applied in the draw as an extra incentive for those that support all things top split in that way. I'll leave a link in the description of the podcast to the competition page and your first entry is free. So there's nothing to lose. Make sure you get amongst it. Today, my guest was Mr. Fahim Antoniadis. I've been known to refer to Fahim as a gentleman and a scholar. He's not only an outstanding driver when it comes to the Skip Barber category, but as we've learned from what are becoming quite frequent post-raced interviews after a Monday Night Lights broadcast, he's very articulate and he's considered in his approach to racing is how I'd best describe it. For him and I had a good old chin wag about any and everything Skippies, sim racing and beyond. I've been looking forward to speaking with for him for some time and it's in no small part because of the qualities I was just mentioning that I think he brings to a conversation about our sim racing hobby. We prattled on for quite a while so I won't hold up the show any further and instead I'll give you my catch up with Mr. Fahim Antoniadis. I'd like to start out by welcoming Mr. Fahim Antoniadis to the show. Fahim is one of the top Skip Barber drivers going around, certainly one of the more thoughtful and articulate ones as well. I've been looking forward to shooting the breeze with Fahim about all things iRacing and Skippies for a while now, and I'm very pleased that he's made time for me today. So welcome, Fahim. Oh, thanks a lot, Alex. It's nice to be here. I'm really looking forward to it. Good, you and me both. Um, now, let's start off. I've been pronouncing your name incorrectly, I am sure, for quite some time on the broadcasts. Tell me, can you can you give me the insight? How do I, how do I pronounce your name correctly? Well, you wouldn't be the first, Alex. Um, <laughs> I've given up trying to get the broadcasters at uh, Race Sport TV to get my name right, and I've <laughs> given up. So uh, I'm in danger of disappointing people because they've known me for all these years as Antonides, and uh, right. to correct it, it's, you yes. know, when you... Uh, hear somebody's name pronounced differently, you think that's that's disappointing because I've always <laughs> known him as this. Now I'm going to have to relearn him. Yeah. But but I'll tell you how it's done. If you take three words, the word Anton, yes, the word Yard, and the Ooh. word This, and put them together, you get my name. So try it, Anton Yardis. There you go. You got it. <laughs> Perfect. That's actually really yeah. helpful, Anton Yardis. Yeah, yeah. Anton Yardis. That's how it's pronounced. But you know, don't worry about it. It'll probably slip and you'll get it wrong. But I've got a collection of uh, different variations of my name as long as my arm, you know, from <laughs> fart farting aut automaton to uh, things that I'm not going to mention. So call me whatever you like, mate. <laughs> Antoniadis, that's good. What, <laughs> um, there you go. what, uh, what cultural background? By the way, Alex, yes. I, I've, I, I've, I've, heard, I've seen you presenting or I've heard you presenting yes. some of the uh, Iberian drivers um, on, uh, on your broadcast. And I have to yeah. commend your... Uh, Accent, you're pretty good at that kind of stuff. I, I've seen, so it doesn't surprise me that you you got it straight away. I, I, it's a thing. It's a thing for me, mate. I used to, I used to live in Japan. I did uh, twelve months uh, as a student there, and I've been told I've got an ear for for languages. 
And it, it's yeah. actually a, a point that I make. For example, in my workplace, I, I work with a bunch of people from different different backgrounds, a lot of people from the, the subcontinent and, and mm-hmm. just different. And I always, there's some, I've got to tell you, there's some that I cannot get despite my best efforts. But it, yeah, look, I, I do try to, to get it right, and I do make the effort because uh, I think it's I think it's the right thing to do. But uh, that's good. But again, what what uh, what sort of cultural background is your name? Well, it's it's a mixed one. Um, Antoniades is a a Greek name, right? Uh, it's Greek separate to be to be precise. Yes. Uh, it's a very common name in in the island of Cyprus. Right. And uh, Fahim is. Um, an Afghan name. It's it's actually a Persian name. Yeah. Um, and my mother is uh, Afghan in origin, yeah. and my my dad is Cypriot. So, wow. and it, and it's also very common. For him, it's a very common uh, Persian name as well. So, between the two common names, I'm the virtual equivalent of a John Smith, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit <laughs> of a stretch, <laughs> mate. But I'll but I'll go with it. That's really. I'll change my name to that. It's a lot easier. Well, I tell but you, like that, you, yeah. you know, I, I've lived in several countries and uh, as a kid as you're growing up you soak up languages like a sponge as i did so it's nothing to do with the brains or anything it's just lucky enough that i've traveled around the world and my parents job led them there and 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 i had to live in different countries for a sustained period of time long enough to to pick up languages so um um I, i that's why i noticed that you had a an ear for uh for, for for names uh because i i naturally have to pick that up as a as a kid yeah i appreciate <laughs> it i do i do try my best uh, even though I, I do have to apologize for butchering some of them on some occasions um when you see them for the first time that, that process that you you're going through but i do have a go um yeah i remember my universe i went i eventually studied um japanese at university and my professor there he said um mimigai which is uh, you've got a good ear um uh-huh. at the same time he was you know uh counseling me for my lack of attendance because it was the football season, you know, and I was out, you know, he said he used to do, at the start of the year, you'd be going great guns <laughs> and then when the footy season had come around, we'd never see you. So anyway. Run out of steam by then. Yeah, well, for, for study anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, mm-hmm. you and I have been conversing briefly uh, at the end of our Mono Not Light races for the past season or so, and it struck me that uh, – Whilst we may live on different planets when it comes to pace, it, it looks like we, I think we have, we think along similar lines when it comes to our racing and racing in the skips. It strikes me that you do a lot of thinking while you, you know, you're in the cockpit in a race. Is, is, is that the case? Uh, I try to. Um, sometimes uh, a lot of people will say that I do no thinking whatsoever when I'm <laughs> racing because uh, then, you know, we all have our odd, odd moments of, uh, momentary lapses of uh, judgment and such but in the main strategically um i i try and uh, think through what is going on and i have to say that that comes with a little bit of experience as well you know more time in a cockpit um allows you to almost go into autopilot um so you don't have to use extra capacity in, in trying to control the car muscle memory takes over and, and, and that just gives you a little bit more capacity to, uh, to think a little bit. But, uh, you know, as you know, that, that comes with, with time and practice. I, I certainly am thinking a lot more than, than if, if I think back of when I first started. I mean, I didn't think at all. All, all I was doing was sweating away, trying to keep the car on the track. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of the base skill, whatever that is, it was always there. The difference has been just the, the track time, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. We do... I, I do strategize and um, mo- most of the time I, I, I get it right. Um, but, you know, it's never perfect. It never can be perfect, I suppose. No, you're exactly right. People, you can't be perfect 100% of the time. And a big part of racing is acknowledging that, I think, in terms of walking away satisfied not only with your own performance but uh, those around you and, and, you know, not succumbing to the red mist, I guess, because, you know, more and more often now, certainly in difference to when I started I've learned not to view stuff immediately someone else's fault go back to the replay look at you know the circumstances and particularly you know something one of my very first podcast episodes was with Philippe Lebert and um 
one thing he said to me that really stuck out was, you know, you make your own luck. Think about where you position your car differently that might have avoided an incident, things like that. But um, the other thing I, I, you know, I have to say I really identify with what you're saying is around muscle memory. And um, certainly in I've, I've played a lot of sport uh, in, in real life and, you know, my fondest memories of, a, of, of any sport that I've been, you know, halfway handy at is, a, say, rugby, for example, I'd arrive at a breakdown uh, mm. where a tackle's been made and I don't have to think about the skills involved. My body would mm. just move into position and do the right thing for the, the, the that the situation demanded. And you know yeah. what, what you're saying about the car, and and being in the car and being able to think more broadly because you've got all that brain capacity freed up. That's not worried about the basic mechanics of driving the car, right? So that's you know makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. And and I remember listening to that uh, podcast with Philippe and and remembering that that. Uh, thing that he said as well uh which stuck to me uh just as it stuck with you which is exactly right and you do make your own luck um and that, and that again making your own luck comes with experience you, you you start recognizing patterns and situations brewing um <clears throat> which have kind of buried themselves in your memory banks from previous mistakes and all of a sudden an, in, an instinct will kick up and say this is the same situation brewing and you either back off or you take a slightly different line preempting something that uh, is is about to happen that you know isn't isn't gonna, isn't going to be your, of your making and lo and behold as soon as you 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 do that little kind of preemptive move the situation that you fear does unfold and you're now no longer in the firing line so so again that comes with uh, time and experience it's just that build, building that memory bank of uh, multiple scenarios and situations that you've experienced throughout your 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 sim racing that that uh, allows you to do that yeah, I agree. And it's, you know, it's also the courage to, there's a couple of scenarios I just wrote, the courage to take a bit of a loss in terms of potential lap time, that lap or whatever, to avoid a situation that you're predicting that's going to happen. It may not eventuate, but your experience and your spidey senses are saying to you, okay, this is going to be something. And, you know, quite often, as you say, that ends up being to your advantage if you've had the courage to back off a bit and position your car you know on a less than optimal line right and then the other thing that i find is uh potentially but using that experience to recognize when Mm -hmm. you've made a mistake and i call it taking your medicine you know you've got a you you can't make a, a bad situation better by you know trying too hard you've got to sometimes just back off get yourself back on track and, and away you go and you can turn a, a bad situation into a much worse one at sometimes if you don't take your medicine and again experience wins out in those sort of situations as well you know i i don't know if you've noticed but it's i'm really i, I think we're on the uh the same wavelength again and I, as i say i don't know if you've noticed but there have been several occasions where we've been calling a, a an mnl race uh, mm-hmm. And you've been in the thick of things, and I've talked about potentially what your strategy might be, or how the, you know, the new Skippy might be influencing that. The new Skippy, as I've been calling it, um, yep. um, you know, since the changes were made most recently, and then, uh, you know, we speak after the race, and it turns out that our thoughts have actually been pretty similar, if not identical. And I can tell you from my perspective, both as a, you know, as a, a would-be commentator and and as a driver, it's very reaffirming for me to to think that I've had similar sort of thought processes to a, in the vein of, of a driver such as yourself. Well, uh, I have noticed now that you mention it, because obviously after each race, I, I go back and and have a look at the broadcast and the, uh, the the same thoughts that I was having during the race, I see them mirrored in exactly what you're saying during uh, the broadcast. So yeah, yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. It's uh, we, we do seem to think alike. Um, yeah, so. yeah. I'll tell you what, like I said, it's, it's very reassuring for me. I don't, I don't have your pace and, 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 you know, results on the track as a result, but it's, it's good. But uh, for the, for the benefit of the, the people that may not have, uh, tuned into some of those those broadcasts one of the things i have been talking about mm-hmm. is, is the new skippies uh, and you've, you've mentioned yeah. it as well what are your thoughts on how those those let's call them undocumented features because they weren't really put in any of the build notes how, how do you think they've they've impacted uh how the skippies drive and more importantly potentially how how the racing is week to week 
Well, um, when it, when they first brought out the new building, as you said, they didn't really explain what the changes were. Um, I think a lot of us were frustrated because I think the first week that uh, uh, the, the first track of the week when after the new build came out was Okayama. Hmm. And um, going into the back straight, um, it was possible to pick up fifth gear just towards uh, the end of the back straight before you start throwing the anchors for the hairpin. Yeah. But it was ever so frustrating, for me at least, to be stuck in fourth and burying the accelerator to the bottom and not being able to reach fifth. Um, and so, you know, other people had noticed that as well. And there was a bit of chat, I'm sure you saw um, in the Skip Barber forums about it. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems like people have kind of got accustomed to it now and, and it's not, it's not a, an issue um, like it was at the beginning. Everyone's got used to it now. And uh, I don't think it's, it's changed the racing in the sense that the Skippy was always an underpowered momentum car. Mm. And, and, and because of that, um, with, with a fixed setup, a virtually fixed setup. Yeah. So therefore, the racing was always going to be close when you have that kind of a package, underpowered momentum car fix sets up um you, you weren't going to get too many variances in performance based on you know um uh, that what kind of a setup you have and and because it's under power there's only so much um you can you can squeeze out of it so um the racing was always close and that's continued to be the same because of those three factors yeah however what what is different is that some of the uh, uh drafting that we used to do because it's a lot less sensitive to drafting mm. um needs a little bit more thought than before because before you could be you know um a good best part of a second behind um and you could just bury the throttle and know that you would eventually be able to outdraft but you can't do that anymore yeah um you really have to think strategically about where you're going to be positioning your car to be in the optimum place to take advantage of a draft and i think that's actually a an improvement as far as i'm concerned because it it it, it makes it a little bit more interesting a little bit more exciting uh, than before so i think you know initially i didn't like it but um because because of this uh extra strategic element to it now i think it's uh it's an improvement um, um on the car yeah i i agree i mean i've spoken about it before in in episodes and and my experience is very very similar to yours where i mean take this last week just gone we, we had it into lagos and and one of my favorite races that we ever called was at into lagos and and i think benny simonson was in the race here the one it or he, he came pretty close and i remember the coming into turn one the final lap the front pack of four went four <coughs> wide four wide into the corner um and wow. Yeah, and, and they all got through, if you can believe it, cleanly. And wow. I mean, you know, the caliber driver in there was great too. And and then you think about again at Interlagos that final corner, and, and these days, you know, four maybe five tenths at best, you can be back and hope to get them on the line. Anything more than that, whereas previously, it was more like seven or eight tenths. And you were actually yeah. probably backing off a bit to get the run, so you wouldn't almost get drafted back in some respects, uh, or at least the side yeah, draft might right, kick in. Right. So, you know, that's that's one small example in terms of how a racetrack's changed because we don't see as often. We might get, you know, two, three wide into turn one fairly regularly, certainly two wide, but, uh, you know, the, the guy four back in a chain be, doesn't get that massive drafting effect to pull him up in line with the leaders uh the same way as we used to you know so i agree with you in terms of it it's for me it's changed the way you have to approach racing although it's interesting you know i was watching uh quirk dice tyson myers stream the other day and he was doing a race mm -hmm. this week at, at uh, interlagos and, mm -hmm. and i was surprised i think he was having a, he wasn't having a great day just generally away from the track but he quit maybe five laps in he was midfield and he quit yeah. five laps in and said, I'm, I'm bored. You know, it's, it's just a draft car and, you know, you wait around to the last lap to go by. And, you know, I, I, I really enjoy Tyson's racing. And I've got to tell you, his, his driving has improved out of sight from my observations, uh, particularly in the, uh, the GT cars. Um, uh -huh. But for me, as a, as a devout Skippy driver, I, I kind of disagree with that. I, I think there is the element of patience and waiting for your opportunity. But I think with the new changes, um, 
certainly you've got options now. You don't have to be yeah. the car behind. You can be the car in front. I think of that battle between you and Enzo at Mossport earlier this season, you know. For me, that was a, yeah. a, a great example of it. Well, you know, another great example of how it's changed was um, watching Philippe race in the 2K Cup at Brazil mm. at uh, um, Interlagos. Yeah. Um, because going back about going back to how um, uh, you need to be about three to four tenths maximum behind the car in front coming out of the last corner to uh, get onto the start finish. Yeah. Well, um, if you if you what can happen, I've noticed is that if you uh, are say about four tenths behind and you manage to catch onto the draft, by the time you're ready to pull out, you 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 could end up in a situation where you've pulled you have to pull out. But there's still enough of a straight left before the start finish line that by pulling out too far out, um, you you hit a brick wall in the air, yeah. and and so therefore it's not a guarantee that you can now just edge past the car that you're drafting, and it could be that you you end up losing that momentum, and you don't go any further, and 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 end up losing the win. And I yeah. noticed what Philippe did is that he, <clears throat> I think he 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 figured that out pretty early because. Rather than catching on to the guys, whoever it was, I think it was, um, who is he racing? Um, it, it must, I think it was Diogo, Diogo yes. Francisco. Yes, yes. Instead of uh, uh, getting on to his draft early in the phase of that whole straight, um, he moved out a little bit and then jumped back in almost halfway um, up the straight because he wanted to make sure that he didn't hit the brick wall mm. when crossing the start finish line. So that's the element of strategy now that you've got to, uh, that's, that's the level of strategy now that you've, you've got to have. And, and I agree with you. It's not, it's not all a, you know, I mean, where, where it becomes a, a, a boring race is when you have maybe a couple of guys who are way uh, faster than the rest of the pack yeah. and are pulling away. And then at that point, yes, it's boring for the guy in second because he doesn't need to do anything, but Correct. sit behind the guy is in first position. But when you're all similarly paced, you can't afford to sit in second because you can get quickly swamped by the guys behind you. And before you know it, you're shuffled down the pack. So there's always going to be this, there always has to be this jostling of positions to make sure, you know, get your elbows out a bit to make sure that you're <laughs> there or thereabouts within the top three so that you're not shuffled too far back in the last lap. So it's still a very exciting car. I think it's one of the best cars on the service when it comes to close racing for me. I mean, I don't have much experience in other cars, but from what I hear from other people, they, they always come back to the Skippy for that exact reason, the close racing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I can, can I tell you, it's one of my favourite parts of both driving and calling races is seeing the decks shuffled in a pack of, of, of skippies because for me you can learn so much about it how a driver and their skill is displayed on track about how they set up a race in a pack of four or five cars what lap they decide to move forward a couple of positions or or one position where they want to be on the last lap to, you know the ones that like to be like Enzo who like to be in front and defend the lead mm. and, and the others who you know Dennis I think did it to you the other night where he and he did it to me during the week as well he did one of his famous you know no qualify come from the back wins and it was him and Greg Seitz did it <laughs> you know and I, I was I was there on pole simply by virtue of the fact that those two chose not to qualify. And Dennis has such amazing skill in moving through yeah. a, a pack of, of slower drivers, um, which is most of us, of course. But then, um, <laughs> you know, he, he got to me uh, after, you know, half the race, essentially. Uh, and mm. then he got in front. And in previous seasons, I would have uh, just sat there in his draft and and you know seen what I could do on the last on the last lap. But I, I decided to roll the dice and go past. And then he he chose to stay behind and just you know uh, more out of sympathy than anything else. Gee, I tell you what, I learned a lot just from watching him in my mirrors. You know, he was bra <laughs> he was breaking so much later. He was you know the car control of the man's mm. insane to be honest. But anyway, that's that's another yeah. story. Um, no, you know. There's so many top flight drivers in in the Skippy, um, in the Skippy uh, community, and I, I I the thing about the interesting thing about sim racing as opposed to real world racing is that the skill uh, that you have to have and the inputs that you have to uh, make are 
very relevant to real world racing. I mean, it's not physical in the same way that real world racing is, but mm. the skill set required is directly transferable to, to, to real world racing. And of course, we've seen a few people who've made that transition from the sim world into, into the real world and vice versa. Some of the sim uh, real world guys are, are actively racing here as well. Yeah. Um, but um, the, the, the thing about it is that um, it, it it is a very direct connection to to the real world and the racecraft that you develop in the sim world um a lot of people argue that you know sim racers they, they've got better racecraft than real world racers for the very simple fact that as a sim racer i can i can clock up a thousand races mm. in a year if i wanted to yeah whereas you know somebody like rubens barrichello who who's got the world record for the most grand prix I don't know how many he's done, 230 odd Grand Prix. Mm. It's taken him 25 years or 20 years to, to clock that many races. Where now, now, you and I can clock you know, 200 races in a month if we wanted to. Yeah. That's a hell of a lot of track time. And um, so, so, I mean, I don't have any real world racing experience myself, mm. um, but I, I'm just going off what, what people who have got real world racing experience are saying about. Uh, um the the you know the sim racing and and how how it is relevant and and you do learn racecraft it is a good great training tool for 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 acquiring um um racecraft yeah look and i, I as you say I, I again i haven't had any track time in real life to speak of beyond the local go-karting track uh, it's actually uh, one of the questions that i uh, i get frequently asked to ask people that come on so you've answered that Good one. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, but can I tell you, mm. I suspected I suspected you hadn't either, uh, only because of, you know, I, I watch these things obviously doing the broadcasts and other things, uh, and I'd, I'd describe the mannerisms of the way you handle a car as, as different uh, to some drivers that I've, I've raced against or watched who on further investigation turn out to have real track experience or, or race experience. Really? Yeah, you haven't found that you can get an indication uh, on, on whether or not someone has real life experience by by racing with them and watching how they handle a car? Do you know, um, I don't think I, I have. Um, well, I, I know people like Philippe used to race yes. and I've seen a lot of his laps. Yes. And what strikes me about the way he does it is that it's so effortless and smooth and yeah. controlled. Mm. Um, it's it's almost um, it, it it's it's almost like AI is is controlling the car. Yeah. And then you look at somebody like um, Benny, yes. who again has real real world experience, and mm. and he kicks the back end out, and it's yep. sliding here and there, and <laughs> and he's he's really throwing the rotating the car. Yes. It's almost like he's forcing it to rotate. I mean, he's got his brake balance down to 47 or something. Oh, he does um, it, does he? That's crazy. He does. Yeah, I know. I don't know how he does that, which which explains why the back end is kicking out all the time yeah. the way it, it does. But he seems to find speed from there. So I suppose looking at those two examples, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that you can't tell who's a real world racer and who isn't. But um, maybe you've seen something that I haven't. Um, but I haven't noticed. I haven't looked beyond those two. Yeah, it's funny, you know, I mean, some of us joke, I don't know if you've, you've seen the jokes floating around sometimes about karting champions and the like, but, uh, you know, for me, and, and it's just a, a theory that I have, I feel like I can often get a sense of whether or not someone has had real track experience by the way they position and, and handle their car, particularly in, in terms of cornering. Now, you described Benny Simonson, and, mm -hmm. and I, ha I haven't observed him terribly much uh, as such but what i have seen has been my opinions have been kind of similar to yours um but I irrespective of the pace that the these guys have um like i said often it's it's how they turn into a corner or yeah. or where they put their car in attack or defense um and it's certainly mm -hmm. not true of all all drivers i think someone like philippe as you suggest or, or even dennis johansson dj um, who, who I know Dennis has got pretty extensive track experience as well, um, or even Benny Simpson, as you mentioned, as, as another that I've seen who they, well, Philippe and, and Dennis, for example, they don't have some of the characteristics that I'm referring to where, uh, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, a, there's a heavy rotation on corner entry, a real attack into the corner, and they turn in much later than I would normally uh, myself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And... 
you know, I've yeah. often wondered if, uh, you know, people, someone like Philippe or, or Dennis, uh, and I always marvel at his car control, uh, if, if they've had to modify their styles to suit the sim rather than just yeah. stick with what works for them in real life, you know. I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, yeah, I um, I think that, you know, there's got to be some differences between sim racing and, and real world racing. And yeah. one, one of the biggest, I mean, I say uh, I have no track experience. I had one track day many years ago. Yeah. A friend of uh, a friend who was quite wealthy, but he's still quite wealthy, <laughs> uh, spent a lot of money. Uh, he was a petrol head, so you can imagine where some of his money went. And yeah. he had a, a kind of a, his own club racing team. <clears throat> but at the same time, he had a little side business, which was um, you know kind of corporate entertainment. Um, um uh, several cars he had a uh a few porsche uh cayennes he had a few caterums and one of them was i can't remember which caterum it was but it was the one with uh i don't know how many it's like 400 brake horsepower and it had Jesus, a yeah. sequential sequential shifter and uh, he had a juno which which is um like the feeder series to to the le mans so it's it's oh, like oh. A, a prototype um trainer wow. high downforce um and um we went to silverstone he invited me out um to to spend a day he had a lot of uh his clients there yeah um who he he you know brought along as a as a kind of a thank you and uh i i went along as well and uh we had a great time um from morning until the sun rose right at dawn all the way till dusk we thrashed around at, at silverstone the, the gp <laughs> nice. circuit yeah and it was uh you know, and and so as you can imagine, the whole day just uh, the, the caterum was absolutely amazing. Yeah, and um, I did I did put his one of his uh, tra- uh, what do they call them instructors, driving instructors. I put his nose a bit out of the joint because I ended up doing a, a lap which was slightly quicker than his. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was the, the the first and only time I had a, a track experience, other than you know the odd go karting. Yeah, but but from what I hear. Um, going back to this guy he does a lot of uh, real world racing um and um you'd be surprised um to hear that the you know the brakes the stiffness on on how we like how stiff we like to have our our brakes isn't always the case with real world racing and 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 all the force feedback um cores who who want to have really really strong force feedback again it's not how it necessarily is in real world racing it it, it could be and, and so therefore the inputs can be slightly different mm. um and and sim racing habits aren't 100 percent like real world racing habits as which is probably no surprise um to hear for anyone really no i mean it's a sim at the end of the day it's probably not going to get it every you know it, it completely correct but also i imagine you know there's a, a plethora of different cars and we've all only well i assume most of us only got one setup right so you can't emulate accurately that uh that wide variety as well but um well mate it sounds like a fantastic experience if nothing else and uh, i'm sitting hey, here, it was good fun yeah sitting here jealously imagining myself <laughs> something like that um I, I put out the call to in a few different mediums about uh questions that people might like to ask you and uh, one of the ones that came up was uh how did you how did you find your pace i'll get a sense of what you were saying before around seat time but um did was it a result of time on, on the track or, or or did you always just seem to have it well uh i i it'll be pretentious of me to say that i always had it um <laughs> i mean people have different different levels of ability yeah that's right um and and you will you will hit your ceiling whatever that natural ceiling is but um, irrespective of what your pace is, the question is: Are you able to uh, reach the the ceiling that 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 whatever that natural ceiling is? Are you able to reach that, and and to be able to get to that point? Because you see, the joy of of taking a car around a track it doesn't matter if it's uh, a fast car or a slow car is that if you know that you've explored your limits uh, as much as you can, then you know in your mind you're 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 going to Get the endorphins out of that aren't you from yeah. from 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 just knowing that you've you've done the best that you could you could have done and that only comes with, with track time the ability thing you know we all have different levels and and um you reach your ability 
uh, if you give enough time and practice to to doing it. So, you know, I can't comment on pace because that's just down to the natural order of things, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's it. I mean, I think you're right. I think it boils down to largely potentially, you know, as you say, people have got a, a finite uh, level that they can reach and it's whether or not they put the time in to reach that level and for some people they might have this, this outstanding level of pace and skill and all the rest of it but it might take them more time to reach it you know late bloomer as it were um but uh interesting yeah. sorry go ahead well you know on that note i mean in my case if, if you really want to pin me down to 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 uh, uh, explain how i found my pace Mm. Is that you really got to think, in my case anyway, it might be different for other people, but I really had to think about what it is that I was doing. So, <clears throat> and and you know, when I say really think about it, I'm not an ana- analytical guy in the sense that I, um, I don't even know what telemetry is. I mean, I can't use, I can't read telemetry. So mm. I don't use, uh, I don't use, um, I can't even remember the names Motec, of them now because yeah. I don't use a Motec or, or iSpeed. Um, and um I it's just because <clears throat> I'm a family man. I've got wife and kids and a business to run, so it, it's really a drive and drive. But the thinking that I do is about what I'm actually doing while I'm doing the driving. What I've learned over the years is that there's always a little bit more that you can do. So it could be little things, and and I suppose the biggest thing that people can do to try and improve their lap times is you'd be surprised how much of the track people waste. Yeah. They think that they're on the optimum racing line, but when they actually watch a replay of themselves doing it, you'll see that there might be, you know, even half a meter to the left or to the right can make a big difference on your entry and exit speeds. And you do that enough times every corner. And given that there might be maybe, I don't know, five or six corners, a tenth of the time for each corner that you lose or gain by being in the right position on the track could end up improving your lap times by, you know, as much as half a percent, uh, sorry, half, half a second. So, so don't take it for really challenge, really challenge yourselves to, to, uh, and, and ask yourselves, am I really using the track limits here properly? And you, and, 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 and I wouldn't be surprised if some people think, blimey, you know what, I, I really haven't been doing that. So that's probably a good starting point. And then the second thing would be to really think about how delicate your inputs are going to be, whether you're braking or accelerating or steering, um, there's always a little bit extra level of fidelity and delicacy that you can find if you really focus on those inputs. And that can focus your inputs uh, to finding a little bit more time. In fact, you'll probably find a lot more time by, by doing that. And then, uh, you know, as far as the skip is concerned, um, the i think that one of the biggest secrets on on getting time out of the skippy i think it's all about how you come off the brake um because it is a car that responds to you know it's important to get on the brakes properly and get the car rotating but how you come off the brake is very important as well a lot of people just lift off or snap off and what you'll find is that if you brake deep and come off the brake gently and experiment with being able to come off the brake gently Almost as if the reverse of an accelerator. If you had a high-powered car, you wouldn't mm-hmm. be burying the accelerator because you get wheel spin, wouldn't you? Yeah, you yeah. want to be modulating that accelerator uh, until you, so that you maximize traction and speed. Well, it's the same with coming off the brakes on the skippy. You want to modulate coming off that brake properly so that um, you're maximizing your uh, uh, turn in and your entry speed into the corner. So just think about those three things, and, and hopefully that will, uh, will help. Because it, it certainly when other people have asked me this and I've given them this advice, it, it's, it's, it's helped them out. Yeah. Very fa- fascinating, mate. I, uh, I can certainly, I can't speak to the second two, although I'm going to go away and think about them quite a bit, but the, the, <laughs> uh, track limits and using the extent of the track is something that I know for me, something that holds me back. And even though, you know, I've improved over time and, and in recent times still made some improvements and, I put a lot of that down to using more of the track. I still, I'll watch a replay of a race or, you know, go through and review stuff, certain elements of a race and I watch the guy in front of me using, you know, a tyre width further or, you know, yeah. the suspension width further of the track outside and I say, you know, you've, 
it, it does mean so much, you know, and it's yeah. it's a really good point that you make. You know, I found it really interesting that not long ago um, you uh, had a session with Johnny Gindy uh, and the reaction that, oh, yes. it, that it brought about uh, when you got some tuition from him. And, of course, I mean, he's been a guest on the podcast before and his story is amazing, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, what mm-hmm. made you seek him out? Well, I think it's it's um, more uh, because I I, th- I felt that I, I I could do better, but I didn't know how to use telemetry and how to analyze my 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 lap times and 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 see where um, I could squeeze out a little bit more than than I was able to just going by feel because I could then apply a bit of science behind it. So it was it was more to see. If I could get anything out of a session where someone's going through telemetry, his telemetry and my telemetry, that would teach me something about um, using telemetry to, to to improve my laps. And the answer to that was yes. I was, uh, you know, he because he's someone who's obviously um, been in the real world racing as well. He's had yeah. to, you know, he's a pretty much a pro racer. He, he needs to understand these things. I thought. You know, he's a skippy driver. He's got real world experience. So he's got to have experience with telemetry and setups. Um, could be a perfect guy to learn from mm. because I don't know how to set up the car. I don't think it matters in the skippy, but even if it did, I wouldn't know what to do to affect what, which way. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, again, clueless on telemetry. So that's why I thought I'd, I'd, I'd get a, a session and it was very insightful. What the telemetry did show me was that, you know, it, I, I it confirms some of the stuff that I already knew, such as what we've just discussed, using yeah. the track limits properly, coming off the brakes properly, yep. and the delicacy of the inputs. But one thing I hadn't been paying so much attention to was my steering angle mm. and making sure that you um, are not, um, and again, that, that's all down to track, uh, positioning the car properly on the track mm. to make sure that you are entering the corner in such a way that you're not scrubbing off speed by either understeering or 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 um well basically yes it's made i mean this car does understeer and there's a lot of people who, who basically have too much lock on and they're plowing through the corner yes. and it might you might not f- feel like you are um but the telemetry shows that you are yeah and where you know in, in places like um talking of okayama again uh coming onto the back straight before you get onto the back straight there's that kind of uphill right hander Mm-hmm. Uh, which is quite a long uphill right-hander. I can't remember the name of the corner, but or the, or the, on the number of the corner, but you know which one I mean. Yeah, I do. And a lot of people end up plowing through that corner, which obviously kills their speed coming onto the uh, main straight. So that's what the telemetry showed. And um, I'm a lot more conscious about uh, my steering angle. And I, and I watch my front wheels a lot more when I'm going into a corner to make sure that they look as if they're pointing in the right direction. Yeah. Um, um, and I think that helped me a little bit. But having said that, after that session, um, I went back to the telemetry. I looked at it again. I thought, buddy, I need to revisit this. I can't be asked. So I'm, I'm still driving <laughs> blind. I, I still haven't learned how to use telemetry. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you, I, I thought the uh, the reactions to you, you know, working with him and, and, and posting up on the forums about it uh, were quite interesting. They were, they were mixed in some cases for some reason, personally. I thought it showed a, a, an open mind and a healthy ego. Someone always looking to improve uh, is someone who doesn't think or assume that they're the best, uh, you know, either in amongst the cohort or the best that they can be. And then to come out and talk about it and sing the praises of the experience, you know, I, I thought was pretty classy too. What, what did you make of some of the reactions? Do you know, I didn't see much of the reactions. Again, I don't have too much time to go through yeah, it all, but yeah. uh, I... You tell me what what kind of reactions were there? Oh, like look, for example, I, oh, I walked away from it feeling that people mm. were, you know, surprised, and you know, I've got to tell you, on the positive side of things, uh, some things mm. that I can remember specifically was people, you know, um, surprised and. and Intimidate is not the right word, but you know, they're going, Holy crap, he was fast enough already. What am I going to do now? He's half a second faster, sort of thing. Um, but whatever yeah. the, whatever the yeah. reactions were, and again, I, I struggle to remember the specifics other than the fact that I walked away from it being surprised that there was a bit of a sentiment, mixed sentiments about it. Um, well, I think you know, uh, 
uh, first of all, I think the day you think that you've stopped learning something new is is a sad day because yeah. I think yeah. there's always room to improve because even if you are on top flight pace as somebody else and there's nothing between you, you know, there isn't a heads width between you, the fact remains that whoever that other person is will do it in a slightly different way to you. And mm. that's why we all have different driving styles. Yeah. So the end result might be the same, but the styles are different. And to think that you can't learn of somebody else's style, I think would be to shut your mind off to uh, new possibilities. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the other reasons why I thought I'd, 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 I'd do that. But the main reason was to learn the telemetry. In terms of me coming out to say that that's what I've done, well, I thought it was... I thought it was good. And I mean, I fully expected Johnny to come back and say, sorry, mate, and no, because, you know, uh, you can understand that if if he has some knowledge over me, which which might then give away his secrets, mm. um, I would fully understand why he would say no to that, because he yeah. wouldn't want somebody so close on pace to him to, to be able to learn something that's going to, you know... <laughs> um, uh, Aid them competitively. Out, out, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, but he, he graciously said, yes, no problem. The only problem he thought he'd have is that because we were so close in pace, he'd, he'd find it difficult to to um, to pick up on any stuff that I might be doing wrong. But then he himself thought cleverly that that's quite a good challenge for him because it, mm. it would really hone his skills in learning and, and picking out the fine details in the telemetry between us. So So for him, it was interesting from that point of view. And then because he was gracious enough to say, yes, okay, let's go ahead and do it. And because I learned so much of it, I thought it would be silly of me not to tell everybody else um, out there that it, he did a great job. And it was really informative and insightful uh, just to paint back a little bit of, you know, and, and, and I hope he did. I'm sure he did pick up a bit of it, uh, additional business off the back of that. Uh, but that was my main intention is to say thank you. And, um, you know, guys, try him out just to put some business his way for helping me out. Yeah, mate, like I said, I thought it was a really classy thing that you did, both in terms of being open to seek out the help, but then to come out and, and promote it in such a positive way. I reckon plenty of others would have you know, not not either taken up the, the opportunity or sought it out and done it, uh, or, or, yeah, then, well. or then not said anything about it. You know, if nobody took anything mm. else away from it i hope your endorsement and the, and the discussion around it sent many other people johnny's way for both his sake and theirs you know what i mean yeah you know like i said there's 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 always someone who can do better than you or just as well as you but in a different way and and uh i think it'll be silly to shut your mind to that yeah exactly now i know you've uh well i'm going to call it recently joined uh team Ivana. Uh, yeah, and from what I can tell, they they have an arrangement with Thrustmaster. Um, I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to sample any of the uh, the sponsor's product, as it were. Well, it's in discussion at the moment. Um, we haven't uh, finalised, from what I understand, totally the mechanics behind it um, and um, um, what what we can and, and can't do. Yeah. Um, so. The details are being worked out, um, but as as it stands, um, don't forget that Thrustmaster is mainly an enduro racing team. Yeah, and yeah. Um, you know the, the 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 Skip Barber element of it is is just a little sideshow for them. You know they they <laughs> kind of they joke they joke. Oh, here comes here comes the noob whenever I come across because I'm in a <laughs> in a trainee car. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think um, you know um, the at any sampling of the uh, equipment that will come out will we'll go to the gt guys yeah, um yeah. and the enduro guys first um yeah. and um but um i think the the way it will work from what i understand is that um if uh we we, we will be allowed to use any equipment which um uh, which have should we say features that the Thrustmaster product range won't yeah. have, oh, okay. such yeah, as yeah, yeah. hydraulic brake cells, yeah. uh, hydraulic yeah. brake pedals with load cells, yeah. or direct drive wheels? Mm. Um, if there is, if they if, if they have that product, and of course we'll be using it, but if they yeah, don't, then course. then we we can use whatever we like. Yeah, because uh, um, one of the questions that uh, people had for me was uh, they're interested to know, you know, for example, the the uh, TSPC wheel. 
and and things mm-hmm. like that. Because I mean, I know I've mm-hmm. I've got a Thrustmaster T three hundred. At some stage, it'll you know eventually warrant mm-hmm. uh, replace you an upgrade, and that's certainly you know at the top end of their gear and something I'm interested in as well. So, be interested to know yeah. going forward, mate. If you get any samples of the sponsors' product, uh, some of the feedback would be interesting. Um, but certainly, the question sure. I, get, I get asked, ask my guests most, is what sort of gear do they run? So, what's your sim racing setup like? Right. So at the moment, I've got um, <clears throat> um, Husenfeld Pro pedals. Yep. Right. I I just run the because I only run the skip. I just uh, run the brake and, uh, and and the accelerator pedal on that. Yeah. And I have to say that um, you know I mean. <sighs> They're, they're just unbelievable um, mm. set of pedals. I would thoroughly recommend them to anybody. It's, it's, I mean, they're a work of art to begin with, the way they're designed. They look yeah. beautiful. Uh, but they're so robust. They're so well engineered that you can, there's no way you can, you can put any forces through them which will break them in any way. Mm. Um, and, and the brake pedal has a very solid and progressive feel to it. Having said that, I invested in a little, before I got these pedals, I invested in a little mod on um, my old G27 pedal set. Yeah. And it was a uh, hydraulic load cell uh, mod on the brake pedal, um, which I got from TSS, which is totally Spanish simulators. And I don't know if they're still running or doing that mod or not, but yeah. this is a few years back, about four years ago, I think. Mm. And that was just as good a mod on my G27 pedal um, as the current um, Husenfeld brake pedal. Right. Um, so there's a lot of good products out there. And, and, and if you haven't really looked into beefing up your brake pedals, then, then do because that's that's the most important pedal in sim racing and any racing, really. So that, that's the pedals I've got. Then I've got um, a um, open source wheel kit from Sim Racing Bay. Um, oh, okay. It's the... Um, old uh, uh what is it the argon based kit yeah um i bought it second hand off uh, a, a guy in stevenage where lewis Hamilton comes from he's not far he's yeah. about, about 40 minutes away from where i live yeah um he uh uh sold it to me when was that about two years ago yeah um and it's got the um which mige is it the uh, smaller of the mige uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, the M-I-G-E, I'm sure it's yep. my yep. uh, motors. And that's coupled to a GT1 SRC um, um, wheel, which I got from, um, again, from um, Sim Racing Sim Racing Coach, the Spanish guys who I bought the, um, the, the brake mod for my G27 from. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's coupled to a um, kind of a, a little steering wheel um 32 centimeter rim i think it is you know just 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 the right size for the skippy yeah nice. um and it's and it's it's um really you know it's it's decent kit and um i'm really enjoying it although i'm having some issues with uh um blinking as i know that you've noticed and and we believe that that's got something to do with the electromagnetic interference that the uh, motor is kicking out during the high force feedback sections of the track because I always blink in the same part of the track and I believe that's to do with um, uh, force feedback spiking and the EMI kicking out. So uh, some of the UK and I uh, racing community, people like Simon Edwards and a whole bunch of others have, have really been helpful in investing time and effort. Uh, Simon jumped on my PC through TeamViewer and and spent about two three hours tweaking the pc and wow. eliminating different things that it could have been and i think we've nailed it down to it being an emi issue so we're going to try and find a way to isolate that and uh, hopefully that will work so anyone who's got an open source wheel uh i'm sure the modern ones are pretty good but be 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 uh, mindful of uh the emi uh, outputs that uh, it can generate wow oh, fascinating to see how that one plays out mate i hope it works out well for you in that regard, and I was saying before we came on that uh, I'm great that the community is coming around to help because I think iRacing is a pretty pretty tight community when it comes to things like that, and I was, I've certainly seen that happen a lot as well. Um, jumping back to your uh, your new team, uh, yeah, for for a sec. Uh, on a Monday night, we get to see you and Enzo up the point end and and frequently 
putting on a good show for us. But you know, both of you at different times have men- mentioned the success of some of your teammates uh, that, that have enjoyed in other categories. Um, can you tell me a bit more about Team Mavana? You know what? I, I, I came into the team very late. I came into it, um, when was it? The beginning of the year, wasn't it? Yeah. The beginning of last year. Now it's been the new year, aren't we? Yeah. And the way, the way it started for me was um, <clears throat> Enzo. It's an Italian team, yes. right? So they're, they're, they, they're based in, in, well, I mean, we've got a lot of international drivers and a lot of British drivers now to the concern of some of the Italian founders of the team. <laughs> they <laughs> yeah. want to try and rebalance it a little bit. But, you know, we've got, Drivers from France, from Germany, from um, Denmark, from the USA, uh, UK, Italy. Uh, I think there's some somebody from Brazil as well. Um, but the team uh, is has been ranked as the by by what is it the Sim Racing Observer, Jake Sperry's um, uh, publication on sim racing. Yep. Um, as the seventh best. Um, sim racing team in the world. Right. There's a, there's a, it, 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 you've got a guy got there called, for, for anyone who's not really, uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know much about um, all the other racing categories outside of Skip Barber, so I'm probably the worst person to ask <laughs> <laughs> about the team, but I know this much that people like Marcus Hamilton um, and um, a few of the other guys there are considered to be uh, some of the best enduro racers going in uh, in sim racing and if you look up the uh thrustmaster mivana website yeah. you'll see results of the latest races and it's nothing but wins 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 or podiums so they they really got their their uh stuff together when it comes to uh enduro racing but you know the way i came into the team it was simple enzo was the uh, lone skip barber wolf in that pack um <laughs> and um he, um, I suppose he reached out to me, and I think the reason why is because, you know, en- Enzo over the years has taken a lot of flack from, from the other Skip Barber community yes, members yeah, because yes. of his, uh, his uh, 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 behavior on track. Some of it deservedly so, yep. um, but a lot of it because of his, uh, you know, hot-headed uh, antics on track. Um, and he's he's never you know been malicious or or intentionally wanted to wreck anybody. It's just mm. that he's been you know not very. He's been quite. He he admits it himself. I'm a hothead, <laughs> and sometimes I I lose my brain. He says, <laughs> but but because of but because of that, <clears throat> um, people have been quite harsh and they've been blaming him on stuff which really hasn't been his fault and yeah. have been branding him as as the you know the um the, the, the evil the guy place, on yeah. track yeah exactly so i've i've come out a few times and and publicly offended him on that so mm. maybe that's why he reached out to me and said mate do you want to join this team and i said well i i can't do commitment because i i got so much other stuff and he goes don't worry it's no commitment because obviously they're focused on the uh <laughs> uh enduro racing and uh the skip barber is just uh it's just a little sideshow yeah. But since you know, I've, it, 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 they, they were a great bunch of guys. They've been very happy to have me along, and um, they 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 watch the races frequently. Mm. Um, and um, what they can't believe is how close the racing is. Yeah. Um, compared to um, insurer racing, because you can be you know stretched no, throughout. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, that, that's as much as I can tell you about the team. They're they're Italian. They're one of the best in the world for insurer racing, and I'm very happy and lucky to be there because. It's not easy if you're a Skip Barber driver to join a team. No one really seems to be. They all seem to be geared towards the higher categories. Yeah, that's um, right. There's, yeah. not, there's not many teams out there. Yeah, you know, I went and checked out the team site the other day, and it looks it looks looks really nice. It's a nice looking site, nice lineup of drivers, as you say. But you know, it was missing, mate. None of the, mm. the posts in the team news entries made mention of the yeah. amazing overall victory in the <laughs> season fourteen of the Monday Night Lights. That one of their newest <laughs> recruits had recently. What's doing there, mate? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, maybe they don't want it to be over. Their main core team to be overshadowed by the mis- the, the the measly skippies. I wouldn't blame them either for that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, but, uh, you're right, mate. It looks like they've got a lot of uh, high level GT and and you know LMP style drivers. Mm. It looks like they've got you know three skippies in there with yourself, Tom 
Ward and, and, and Enzo Cantor, as you say, I, I, you know, got me wondering, did this represent to the team maybe a, an open wheeler development program with a view to getting some drivers in the world championship? You know, maybe there's, there's some avenues there for you. It's uh, certainly brewing and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, one, one of the concerns is that if you spread yourself too thin mm. and opening up too many pedigrees, you lose focus of the main thing that you're good at. Yep. And uh, I did suggest to some of the team members to say, look, well, you know, maybe in the future we can have a spin-off team, you know, mm. a, uh, a specific... A Mivano Mivano Junior or something, you know? Yeah, something like that that uh, deals with, with our pedigree. Um, so, uh, I don't know, call it whatever, Skip Masters Incorporated or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that would be, you know, a pure Skippy team or a MX-5, you know, the junior categories uh, yeah. uh, racing team would be cool. Yeah, look, regardless, mate, I, I want to see greater representation of the, the fine work that you guys do in representing the team in our neck of the woods, all right? A bit, a bit of homework for you there. Um, <laughs> on Monday nights, of course, we've seen... You go head to head with some good races. We saw you with uh, with Dennis Johansson most recently this week, and uh, and you had a great battle with your teammate uh, Enzo, as I mentioned at, at Mosport last season. Um, yeah. Monday night lights or otherwise, I mean, you do do a lot of racing the skips. Who do you, who do you reckon's your toughest opponent? Well, the toughest opponents are the guys who uh, race in the two K Cup. Yeah, so people like. Um, you know, Johnny Gindy, yeah. Greg Seeds, Philippe Leibert, Diogo Francisco, Tuan Tran, um, because that, you know, that, that league captures, it, it is the premier league in, in, in Skip Barbers. Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, and um, it, um, it, it, you know, I've never really had that much uh, uh, success in, in, in the 2K Cup. You know, I've got a few poles and maybe a couple of podiums, but really inconsistent results and some of it's to do with the fact that i don't get to race until uh late in the weekend usually yeah um and um you know whenever i have had time to um race throughout the week you know during downtime or holiday season where i've really actually ignored the family and everything else and just focused on on the car mm. uh from monday to monday i found that uh, I'm always picking up speed as the days go by until it peaks towards the end of the week where I'm pretty much, you know, able to set fastest TT times in the world and such and such. So in my case, at least, it takes a good week to build up to optimum pace. Mm. Um, and um, because I, 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 you know, work schedule and, and family schedule, um, I don't really get to, I'm not in top form to perform during the 2K Cup. Whereas, uh, you know, those, that race there is almost like a, um, a training race, a warm-up race for me to perform better at, uh, on Mondays, which is obviously when I'm racing with you guys yep. and uh, the, um, the UK and I uh, uh, Monday night skippies races. Um, so they are the toughest competition in that, in that sense. Um, B, a because there's more international drivers there, and B because I'm I'm not in um, usually in top form, um, but I'm going to try and see if I can rectify that, uh, not this season, but the season after, and and see if I can uh, see how far I can get in in that league as well. Yeah, look, uh, you know, you mentioned poles and and podiums and what have you. I'd suggest that along with your uh, potential, you know, disparity in, in time available to practice that the calibre of the driver in there might have something to do with, uh, con you know, consistency in the results there as mm. well. It's tough to get a to get a good result there, let alone one consistently. I know uh, Luke Witten is uh, one of our top skippy drivers. I know he's been away from the scene a little bit lately and he switched to VR and some uh, new baby and, and all these things have contributed to him not being as strong lately as he has been, although it's great to see him back on track again. Uh, he he's won one of the races you know and, and for us that was yeah. massive you know but it's only one mm. right mm. but i, I yeah. still refer yeah. to that as you know an amazing achievement in of itself um it really so, is, yeah. yeah so i mean obviously you come and race with us in the australian new zealand soft race on a monday night 
uh, and are able to because of a, a change of routine uh, for you in recent times you mentioned but otherwise yeah. we wouldn't we wouldn't have the pleasure of your company for which I can tell you we're very appreciative of but can you tell me uh, you mentioned briefly a couple of times uh, can you tell me a little bit about the UK and I club scene i mean time zones mean that obviously it makes yeah. it hard for folks like me in, the, in another hemisphere to get much visibility of it but you guys look to have uh the opportunity to race in in equally and higher strength of fields than than we can muster even with something like the monday night lights but you also have uh, the monday night skippies league races that seem to draw massive fields i mean i i, I saw the one uh from interlagos this week 60 cars uh, on, right. on the grid, you know. I mean, uh, you and uh, you mentioned uh, it was it Simon Edwards, I think it was. Yeah. You mentioned you guys had a, a great race, and I mean, you nearly took the chocolates there, mate. But uh, what <laughs> what, what do you think is the the big attraction that that draws such massive interest from the club? Well, I mean, the club's been around before my involvement. Um, it was around for a few, maybe about three years, two or three years before my involvement. So. Uh, and, and the guy who's been running it since I've been involved is uh, Alan Patterson. Um, he he didn't set the league up. Um, he's just picked up the mantle from others, and, and he's done a fantastic job. It's an interesting league because it's not governed by strict rules and regulations in terms of, uh, you know, having a, um, a stewards panel to yep. review. Uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't even have a, a, a limit on, on the number of off-tracks. Yeah. Um, and um, Alan's uh, kind of input has been key in cultivating a culture culture of gentlemanly type behavior. Yeah, everyone expects to behave properly, and everybody does. Mm. So, um, you know, where mistakes happen, everyone knows that it's not intentional. Um, and whilst you know, there's it swings and roundabouts. If you don't have a proper framework like the two K two K Cup then a lot of um, the uh, potential incidents um, and bad behaviors aren't dealt with and um, they, they, they remain um, if they're not dealt with and repro- you know, if, if, if the perpetrators aren't reprimanded. But at the same time, um, it, it, having the framework and the rules around it almost kind of allows people to then use the rules and frameworks to explore the limits of what they're able to do as opposed to promoting a culture of um, doing the right thing and being courteous on track Um, so i think you need to have the balance of both and we seem to have been able to get away without having any kind of rules other than and 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 in the years that i've been involved there's never been any bad blood arguments maybe the old slight tiff here or there but nothing major yeah. and everybody behaves so that seems to be a cultural thing that alan's uh, generated and in terms of it only being open to the uk and i members a lot of people aren't, aren't happy about that because apart from the 2k cup races um um it is the the next i would say probably almost equal um to that in size in fact the fields you get in the uk and i uh, uh league are larger than the ones that you get in the uh 2k cup yeah um but the reason why it's not open to others um is that it's meant to be a, a platform for the local guys to shine there's it's, you know there are other international leagues open to to people to join yeah um but it's supposed to give um a opportunity for the local boys to you know get themselves seen a little bit on the broadcast and such so you know if you open up if you open up the league to the international community, then it will become the 2K Cup and a lot of the uh, local boys wouldn't have the chance to, to shine as much. But, mm. you know, having said that, um, it, it, it is, it, and, and I suppose that's why it attracts so many people from within the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the UK and I club because it is a chance for them to get some coverage and enjoy seeing themselves racing uh, uh, on a broadcast. Um, so that's why I suppose it's 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 that popular. Um, but um, you know, but having said that, I I genuinely think that pound for pound, the UK nightclubs seem to have their fair share of um, you know really good skip barber drivers, and it's just that that's how you know like the I suppose the uh, Finns, you know they have their uh, little clique of uh, uh, sim racing communities mm. who are racing in specific cars. The UK and I seem to just love the skippies, and that's just how it's it's been evolved, really. Yeah, I mean, it it has a really strong club 
vibe to it. You know, like you, you have your mm-hmm. real your real clubs in real life. Uh, mm-hmm. They have the grassroots sort of feel about them, and, and it strikes me as that's that's uh, very similar. It's certainly, very healthy. Uh, community by the looks of it. I mean, a 60 car field is is amazing. I mean, I, I know I feel like we have a healthy Skippy community in the ANZ club. Uh, it does have a real club feel to it. Probably best represented by the regulars in all splits of the Monday Night Lights races. You know, like yeah. that that for us. It's whilst it's, it's kind of fashioned in a different way. We we obviously have a a much smaller user base. I think uh, and you know but that that's our form of 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 monday night skippies obviously it's at the same time i mean but yeah. uh you know but, that's but that's kind of what is, it represents to me you know well what you have is something unique and different to all the other leagues and and that's the fact that you couple the the actual league up with the official races yeah um so not only do you get uh, a chance for people to you know join a kind of a league broadcast race but also it counts towards um, the um, uh, your, your safety rating and IR rating, and no doubt you'll remember when the stats came out towards the uh, tail end of last season about um, participation and and strength of field races that um, you know the Monday Night Lights um, had the highest average strength of field of any skip other uh, uh, official races um, going so. You know that that is a very very unique aspect that you guys have, and and that's one of the reasons why I'm attracted to it. Yeah, mate. Look, it's, it that was a real feather in our cap, I have to admit, and uh, it was great when uh, you highlighted that or brought it to our attention. And, I, and you know, I've always said for the longest time, you know, it's a platform, particularly for the local guys, but the international drivers like yourself as well, uh, uh, to to have a crack at the official season as much as anything. And I, if I recall correctly, mm. um, Enzo. Uh, won three official seasons on the back, largely of the the, the Monday Night Lights series. So it's a genuine, genuine platform as well. You know, yeah. look, look. I, I don't follow. Um, I know there's an inter club forum and inter club races from time to time. There was even, a, I think, there was a World Championship or a World uh, Cup at one point. But I don't really follow much of that. But I do recall the fantastic events. Um, and if I recall correctly, you were at the at the centre of of where we raced skips against different regions. And obviously the one I yeah. remember most fondly was, of course, was the UK and I versus A and Z where, uh, and I called that race on double RTV with Bernie Winners <laughs> and Rachel, yeah. is it Rachel Whiteford? Um, yes. And uh, in a joint double RTV race spot broadcast that was, Pretty representative, I thought, of the coming together of the two great clubs. And, you know, it was a it was a really enjoyable event. event. Um, any thoughts of reviving the concept? Yeah, I mean, I I was I you know I was sitting at my desk at work one day with idling away, waiting on stuff to happen. Nothing was happening, and I started looking at the uh, um, <laughs> iRacing website, and then it just struck to me because the football was on yeah. as well um, on on the telly, um, and the football was on. I thought, why? why can't we do racing like football where, you know, you've got, you know, 10, 10 guys on, on a field, each with their own, um, you know, kits, their own livery. Yeah. And how could we, how could we do something like that? A team sport, but on track. And that's where the idea came from. Yeah. And then it, that kind of evolved into, well, you can, you can get point to call. How do you qualify for it? So you've got to post the fastest TT times. Uh, each club has got to try and post their fastest TT times. The top 10 guys make it, make the cut. You get points for that as well for for you know um scoring the highest tt times you get points for qualifying and then everybody got a point as well um even the last guy um mm-hmm. because the idea was that the cumulative points of the team um added towards the uh the winner score um so i think the format worked well we did it against uh, the usa yeah uh we, we won that one but that was because you know, what I hadn't appreciated at the time is that there isn't one USA club. You know, there's no. Texas, there's, and it was a lot more difficult for Philippe to get everybody behind it and uh, working. And I'm surprised that he managed to get as far as he did Yeah. Um, to get a team put together. Whereas for the Australian New Zealand club and UK and I, it would have been a lot easier because it's just one club. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would love to do it again. But one of the things that I found really difficult and time consuming was keeping an eye on the TT scores because that was the means by which you had to qualify to make the team. Sure. And and um, I will do it again 
if if you can put the word out, Alex, and ask yes. people in your community as as well as my community, if they can, people can, uh, if somebody can come up with a tool um, or an app that can extract who the top TT times are, so that I wouldn't or somebody wouldn't have to do it manually, mm. um, then um, then we could do this a lot more regularly. We could do it as a week thirteen special every uh, at the end of every season, if you like. Um, almost like the ashes you can get another <laughs> ashes version of uh murder sport uk and i australia new zealand that would be a good little thing to kick off so i don't know if we can get a a tool that can extract the top tt times then then it wouldn't be so labor intensive and easier to 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 do and i'd be happy to do it again there you go folks challenge uh laid out and hopefully accepted we'd like to see more of that because it was a great format but Fahim, don't talk to me about the cricket, mate. I don't know if you've been following it. <laughs> it's not going so good for us at the moment. Uh, listen, Fahim, uh, I'd like to thank you for making uh, the time to join me here today. I've been looking forward to speaking with you for a while now, and I've really enjoyed it. But uh, before we wind up, mate, is there some love or support you'd like to throw out to anyone? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's almost like a, a post-race interview now. Isn't yeah, it? Um, that's it. The, the usual people, you know, the people who I know and love. I hope everything goes well for everyone this year, um, for the start of the new year, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's see if we can keep uh, the uh, Monday Night Lights thing going strong and growing, um, because I really enjoy taking part in these races and and uh, the, the broadcasting that you guys do are fantastic. In fact, I'd go f as far as say that the insights that you give during the races, Alex. Um, in terms of the strategies playing out and what's going on in the driver's head, uh, more spot on than any other commentary that I, I've seen for the Skip Barber. So I, I keep up that good work and uh, long may it continue. Thank you very much, uh, Fame. I really do do appreciate that. Listen, on the uh, on the side, though, I don't know if you caught this week's broadcast, but the uh, the Enzo is is quite popular <laughs> amongst uh, our community for his post race interviews. But this week, just oh, <laughs> mate. Took the biscuit. <laughs> oh, g folks, go to the Top Split YouTube channel. Check out uh, Round Four, Season Fifteen of the Monday Night Lights. Just just skip to the end. <laughs> just listen to the post race interviews, Enzo. <laughs> Uh, love him, love him. All right. Well, Thank I, I sent a message to him to say, well, Enzo, I, I've got no problems with rolling backwards. So yeah, make that, make that. That. <laughs> Listen, thank you once again for joining me. I must say Cheers. for your continued support of the Monday Night Lights series. We're, we're nice better, to talk to you, Alex. Yeah, mate. We're better for it. And look, I'm really appreciative of you joining oh. us for that race. And once again, a huge thank you. To the sk thinking man, Skippy driver, Mr. Fahim Antonite. Oh, I've got it wrong now, Fahim. Oh, <laughs> I told you you get it wrong oh, at the end, no, didn't I? I forgot. <laughs> but thank you once again for joining me, mate. I really do appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, folks, that was my chat with Fahim Antoniadis. I have to tell you that this is not only the type of conversation I had envisaged for my podcast originally. I also feel like I've found somewhat of a kindred spirit in Fahim as far as we seem to both think along very similar lines when it comes to our approach to, to racing. I was quite chuffed to hear that my analysis of the strategic elements of what we've seen of Fahim on track in the Monday night lights broadcasts were at least close to being accurate. Because as someone who's trying to enhance the enjoyment of our hobby with something like the MNL broadcasts, to know that my live analysis as an amateur commentator were in line with anyone's actual thoughts let alone someone at the tip of the spear, as it were, was was quite validating of, of what we're doing in those broadcasts. Beyond that, at least knowing that my strategic mindset, if not my actual skill and speed, was somewhat aligned with the likes of Fahim, was, was also quite a chest-puffing concept uh, to, to walk away with from our conversation. Certainly my opinions of Fahim going into our chat were confirmed in relation to him being a very thoughtful and articulate, and he's obviously a guy who puts a lot of thought into no doubt all facets of his eye racing and beyond. So once again, I'll extend my thanks to Fahim for joining me 
for this episode of the podcast and his ongoing support of Skippy Racing in our part of the world. For now though, folks, I'll remind you that there'll be a link uh, in the podcast description to the Escape from Tarkov giveaway that you'll find uh, running on the Top Split TV Twitch channel where I stream all my attempted racing exploits. Remember that you can always find us on a Monday night on the Top Split YouTube channel with the Monday Night Lights broadcasts that Fahim and I have spoke quite extensively about this time. It's the Australian New Zealand Club Strength of Field Race in the Skip Barber category and you'll not find a better group of regulars and a more consistently enjoyable official racing experience anywhere. The Doctor and I will be back in a couple of weeks with the next instalment of the Splash and Dash version of the podcast. And from there, I've teed up a chat with one of the Australian New Zealand Club's authorities on all things oval racing, which is something I'm looking forward to quite a lot, as oval racing is something that when I do it, I find actually quite heart-poundingly enjoyable for some reason. And it's certainly, though, something that uh, takes a set of skills that I have in no way explored or mastered. So keep an eye out for that in the coming weeks. Thank you once again for joining me after the festive break. I trust everyone had a safe and enjoyable respite from the daily grind as I did. Love that one week of the year where you wake up in the morning and you really have to ask yourself, what day is it? For now, though, I've been your host, Alex McKellar, and you've been listening to The Top Split.